Okay, well, this, uh, we're going to do another article from my prophecyquestions.com website. Uh, this one's entitled, Melding Old and New Testament Judgment Prophecy, an Outline for a Bible Study. So this, this one really is a Bible study. It's not a, 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 an article as such. So it's something you can sit down with your friends and go through all this. Um, but let's start with Luke 21, 22. These are the days of vengeance to fill all that has been written. Have you ever heard a futurist comment on that passage? Yeah, it's it's difficult for them because, uh, but for preterists, it's it's obvious and clear. But exactly what is Jesus referring to here? He's obviously talking about a vengeance event of some sort from the Old Testament. Uh, and it starts in Deuteronomy 27 to 32. So we're going to bounce back and forth between the Old and New Testaments. But uh, go to Deuteronomy 28, really. Open your Bibles, Deuteronomy 28. The setting for this section in Deuteronomy is near the end of Moses' life and uh, near the, the time when the Israelites would move into the land of Canaan. And he's giving some advice. He's basically saying uh, that the, uh, the covenant has been given to you, but there will come a time if you don't obey, when it will be taken away and God's wrath will be poured out. So we're gonna look at some of these passages. You know, and uh, <clears throat> dispensationalists, have this concept that uh, that promises to old covenant Israel were forever, but that's not really truth. Forever only if they're obedient. Let's look at some passages. Twenty-eight, verse one: If you are faithfully obey the voice of your Lord God, and so forth. Uh, verse nine, which I didn't print on the sheet: The Lord will establish you as a people holy to Himself, as He has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And this whole section is filled with its contingencies about and, and the ifs. So verse 15, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord and so forth. Verse 58, if you're not careful to do all the words of the law that are written in this book, Deuteronomy 30 and 16. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God and so forth by loving your Lord, etc. So uh, these promises were clearly contingent. And then in uh, Deuteronomy 31, verse 16, the breaking of the covenant is foretold. I'll read it. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. And then the covenant breakers will be destroyed. Go back to uh, 2820. The Lord will send you send on you curses, confusion, frustration, and all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed. Verse 33, a nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and all your labors, and you shall only be oppressed and crushed continually. Verse 45, all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God and so forth. So Yahweh was to take vengeance on Israel for her disobedience. Look at 32, 35. Now here we see the word vengeance, at least in most translations. Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand. Reference Hebrews 10, 30 to 37. Keep your finger or a, a sheet of paper in Deuteronomy and let's go look at Hebrews 
30, um, Hebrews 32. Hebrews 30. I'm sorry. Um, Hebrews 10, 30. Hebrews 10, 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. So that's a I believe a direct reference to what we saw in Deuteronomy. And then we see in Hebrews 10, 26 and 37, the soon coming day of the Lord. Verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while and the coming one will come and not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure for him. So the eminence of these, the, the second coming and the uh, destruction of Israel were on their minds and clear from Scripture. Now go back to Deuteronomy 32, verses 41 and 43. If I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold of, on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. Verse 43, rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. Now let's go to Isaiah 61. Keep your finger, we'll come back, probably come back to Deuteronomy. But let's go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Now this verse is quoted, though not completely, by Jesus in the New Testament, which we'll look up. But keep that in mind as we read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Now, re, uh, think about this for a second. All of the prophets uh, had the Deuteronomy text, and they were, uh, uh, you'll see this theme reiterated throughout the Old Testament and repeated about the coming vengeance if obedience was not uh, held. Okay, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the uh, opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, go to Luke uh, chapter 4. Verses 18 and 19. Here Jesus is quoting this passage from Isaiah that includes the concept of the Lord's vengeance. And he's saying that it's being fulfilled in, in his time. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stops there. But the rest of the quote from Isaiah was in the day of vengeance of our God. So uh, we see uh, the first and second comings all wrapped up into these prophecies. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy. Okay, when would these things happen? Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see 
what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. And then verse 29. If they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern their latter end. So uh, uh, here, Moses is introducing the concept of the last days that is, is picked up by the other prophets as well as in the New Testament. And uh, we looked up uh, yesterday uh, some verses in Matthew about the end times, the end of the age, and then will come the end in verse uh, 14 of Matthew 24. And so we've seen uh, this concept of the twisted or perverted or crooked generation in Matthew 32. Let's look those up again. I mean, Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. Let's, let's dwell on those for a second. 32, verse 5. They have dealt corruptly with him, and they are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. And then in verse 20, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see that their end will be, they are a perverse generation. So we see that in, all over the New Testament. Uh, we looked up some of these yesterday, but let's just look up a couple of these that I've listed here, beginning with Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, we wish to you to see a sign for you, from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to him and so forth. And all of these, and take the time, we won't necessarily take the time right now to look them up, but when you go home, look up these passages that I've listed here in Matthew and Luke. Peter and Paul also echo this theme about the perverse, crooked, and twisted generation in Acts 2, Philippians 2. We might as well go ahead and look those up. Let's we'll go to Acts 2, verse 40, where we read, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And in Philippians two, which we don't need to look up all of these, uh, you see the exact same thing. Now, compare Deuteronomy 32, 43. Somebody read that one for me. You have Deuteronomy 32, 43. Okay, now let's go to Matthew 23. Okay, this is the famous passage where Jesus makes the statement that <clears throat> the blood of all the prophets will be avenged on the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people of his day, old covenant Israel. So on that may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the righteous blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And it's also um, worth pointing out, you know, this theme is all through especially Matthew's gospel. But uh, Matt, let's take a back up to Matthew 21. In the parable of the tenants, he makes comments uh, such as in uh, Matthew 21, verse 43, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Then in verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived he was speaking about them. 
How can you, how can you miss what's going on here? Right. Now for some further comparison, uh, think about what we just read at the parable of the wedding feast. Let's go to Revelation. Just to tie some of these things together and, and, con and conclude all the way to Revelation. Revelation 6. Revelation 6. Now, this is tedious, but this is what we have to do to get the full understanding of, of these things. We have to dig and, and think about and time together. So Revelation 6, verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? So what we see in, in Revelation is a, a reference clearly to Matthew 23. Okay, Revelation 16, 6. And it's not just a single one, it's all over the place. Revelation 16, 6, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunk with blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs, and so forth. 18, verse 24. And in her, it's talking about the, the harlot. And in her was found the blood of the saints and uh, prophets and of all who have been slain on earth. That's a direct quote from Matthew 23. In 19, verse 2. And his judgments are true and just. He is just a great prostitute who uh, corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of the, of the servants. So all of the prophets had Deuteronomy and referenced it when they spoke of the latter days. We looked at Daniel 12 yesterday, the time of the end. We don't necessarily need to go back there again today, uh, but it would happen when the uh, power of the holy people would be shattered and the burnt offering would be taken away. How can you miss it? It's got to be AD 70. <clears throat> Okay, we compared the abomination of desolation of Daniel 12 to Matthew uh, 24, where you know there's, there are some people who say that the prophecies in Daniel are still future, and yet how do we know that they were fulfilled in the first century? Because Jesus said they would be. The abomination of desolation was coming upon them in fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel. We also looked at yesterday the, uh, uh, the comparison with Daniel 12.4 and Revelation 22.10. We don't need to do that again. And when you get home, take a look at Malachi chapters 3 and 4 and compare to Matthew 3. Now, let's open it up for questions. Have you had an opportunity to discuss any of these things with futurists at any time? Okay, let's, let's <laughs> how about sharing what you've run across? Um, I'm, I'm beginning to become convinced that I'm not going to show anybody anything. No one, unless they're willing to receive it, or unless God reveals it to them. So, Trying to convince someone of a spiritual truth um, is difficult to say the least, but there's 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 a barrier that at times you cannot get through. And maybe some some of the times the best thing you can do is pray for them. Pray for them to have their heart eyes open. Pray for them to have a uh, the eyes open that uh, they need in order to see just truth, period. I mean, <clears throat> truth, the revelation of truth is to, is to work in the role of the Holy Spirit. 
And so we can assist that work naturally if we listen and are obedient to the Spirit in us, because uh, we all are unified by the Spirit. But uh, using intellect and reason may work to some degree on certain people. But you know, when you look at when you look at temperament and the, the worldview of each of each temperament, it's only one. You know, out of the what we believe four or five temperaments that you know are won over by that approach, and that's the approach. So. We need everybody approaching everybody, because you all have different approaches. Does that make sense? And what might what went over one approach is not going to win over another approach. So that's why we need everybody producing material. We need everybody producing videos. We need everybody, you know, getting the material out there with all the different approaches that the Lord and the Father shows you to use with people. My personality, my approach only works with a few people, you know, certain yeah. people. Yeah. So I think just being open to the fact that you may not be the one that's going to lead that person will allow you to be free to reach only those that the Lord's going to lead you to. Right. So I, I'm not going to convince you. Yeah. I'm convinced of that already. Yeah. Well, I think everyone here would like uh, their friends and associates and, and brothers and sisters back home to understand this better or you wouldn't be here. And so... We're, th we're thinking more about how to approach these people. I encourage everybody, many of you are already in Bible studies, but uh, uh, get in a church fellowship if you're not already. Get in a Bible study with uh, people. Earn their trust. You probably know more about Scripture than they do, and you can contribute and help them on things other than eschatology. So earn their trust and their confidence. Uh, agree with them wherever you can. And then when you have an opportunity to challenge them on, on eschatology, your, your message will be heard more clearly. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. These are the days. Of, they, they were the days of vengeance to fulfill all that was written. Amen.